The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Please join me in a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It is wonderful to be here with you all in worship. Uh, I always enjoy being invited, uh, being invited to come and be with you all, and so that is why I said yes, even if I am a little jet-lagged, so bear with me. My family and I just returned on Friday night, actually it was more like Saturday morning, uh, from a two-week vacation in Greece. <laughs> Sounds lovely, right? Let me share a little more. <laughs> I just returned from a two-week vacation in Greece with my four-year-old <laughs> and two other families. We had 11 people, including two sets of squabbling siblings, all sharing the living space of a sailboat. Now, still sound nice? <laughs> in truth, it was in fact a lovely time with dear friends. And yet, I still feel like I need a vacation from my vacation. 
And I share all of this to make a point. And that point is related to our readings today. And that point is this. Two things can be true at the same time, right? I can be even two things that are seemingly opposite. I can be grateful and I can be exhausted. I can have a nice time away from my job and still be doing a lot of work. I can love my friends and my family deeply and also be glad that I am no longer stuck in the, in the middle of the Aegean Sea with them, beautiful as it may be. The readings this morning, I now understood why Pastor Ben took this week off from vacation, right? <laughs> the readings this morning from Ephesians and from the Gospel of Mark couldn't be more different. In Ephesians, we hear praise for an all-powerful and a wonderful God, a God who loves the whole world and made a plan to include everyone in salvation. And then there is the Gospel of Mark and this brutal recounting of the death of John the Baptist. And that story just brings us right out of those heavenly clouds of Ephesians, right? And right back down, crashes us right back down into the sinful earth, where it feels like God is an afterthought at best, with no control at all. And where even the all-powerful king, when the all-powerful king is seemingly interested in what John has to say, he can still be killed in an instant on a whim, at the snap of Herod's fingers. These readings have almost nothing in common. And honestly, that is a gift. Because it forces us to wrestle rather than have everything tied up in a nice little bow. Hearing these readings next to each other this morning we are forced to remember something important. And that is that they are both in the Bible, right? And that reminds us that the Bible contains many truths, not just one truth. Having these readings side by side is an opportunity for us to remember how uniquely we Lutherans read the Bible. All around us, there is this belief that there is this one singular biblical truth. There are many Christians who believe this, and there are many people who struggle with even trying to accept Christianity because they think that's what Christianity is. That's the only definition that they've ever heard. The way we read the Bible is one of our many best-kept secrets. As Lutherans, we believe that the Bible is indeed the very word of God, divinely inspired. And yet, we acknowledge that it was written and put together by people, which makes it not quite perfect, right? We believe fervently that God still speaks directly to us through our reading of the scriptures in our daily lives. And yet, we acknowledge that the words were written to particular people at particular points in history, meaning that how it applies to our life today is open to interpretation, and so it is not a literal word-for-word -word guide on how to live our life today. Today's readings side by side remind us that the Bible and life itself is full of contradictions. What's beautiful about the Bible, though, is that it describes both what is 
and also what will be. And part of how we know that we can trust the vision in the Bible of what will be is that it doesn't shy away from the tough parts of life, of, of what is our earthly experience in this world. And so even Mark, the shortest of all the Gospels, packs it all in, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And up to this point in Mark's story, Jesus has been exerting power over spiritual forces in the world, casting out demons and healing diseases. And of course, at that time, many thought that the diseases were actually rooted in a spiritual problem. But now, in chapter 6, we get the first hint that the spiritual and the political cannot always be separated. John's beheading foreshadows the trouble that Jesus will get himself into. Now the twelve have just been sent out with instructions to go preach the gospel of repentance. And repentance, repentance literally means to turn around, to change course. It is a true change of heart. It requires admitting that you were at fault and doing something about it, changing your pattern, your way of being. Something that politicians apparently, given this story, have been allergic to since the beginning of time. And it cost John the Baptist his life. The story, hard as it is to hear, is an important counterbalance to the praise that is heaped upon God in the opening of the letter to the Ephesians. Because there, we are reminded that God has a plan. And by grace, we miraculously get to be included in it. Thanks be to God, amen? amen? So this is truly something that we should continually marvel at and give thanks for. For it is not of our own doing, but solely a gracious gift from God. Yet, yet we cannot mean, as Lynn was just telling the children, we cannot take this to mean that we as Christians are divinely protected in a way that is different from the rest of the world. God certainly has a plan in the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things on heaven and on earth. But as we see in Mark's gospel, things don't always go as planned. And power here on earth will always be wielded haphazardly. And no one, no matter how innocent or righteous, is immune from the repercussions. And so without these two passages being together this morning side by side, it can be easy for us to gravitate to the parts of scripture that match our mood, right? In a world that is constantly encouraging us to stand our ground and fight for what we believe in, it is tempting to pick a side, dig in our heels, and proclaim, scripture is spiritual. Leave all of the politics out of it. Or, conversely, your faith isn't relevant if you aren't speaking truth to power. As a side note, this is why it's important to be in the habit of reading scripture regularly, so that we have to confront the parts of the Bible that we wouldn't necessarily return to on our own, so that God can speak to us through them. 
Today's readings, side by side, remind us about the importance of dialogue. Scripture can be in dialogue with itself, and we can and should be in dialogue with others about Scripture, even when we disagree. While we were in Greece, one of our friends that we were traveling with, Ray, introduced us to his friend, Nikos. Nikos lives in Greece, and so he joined us for a few days of hiking in the mountains when we were finally off of the sailboat and had a little more space. <laughs> Ray is a Lutheran pastor here in the United States. Nikos, living in Greek, Greece, is, you may have guessed, Greek Orthodox, as is much of the country. Nikos and Ray met more than 20 years ago as young adults committed to ecumenical dialogue through the World Council of Churches. And so over the course of many years, they have spent time together in six or seven different countries, but this was the first time that they had the chance to be together in one of their own countries, and it was the first time that Nikos got to meet Ray's family. Now, I won't bore you with the details of all of our conversations, but perhaps you can imagine what it might have been like for Nikos to be peppered with questions over meals about his faith from the five Lutheran pastors that were on this trip. <laughs> it, was, it, was no, it, it was obvious that we would have to pay for his meals after the barrage of questions that he endured, saved only by the children when they would um, cause trouble. After we parted ways, with Nikos and went on for the rest of our journey, my husband marveled at the community and the closeness and the connection that we formed with Nikos in such a short amount of time, despite how different our traditions are. But I was not surprised, because I knew of the trust the trust that Nikos and Ray had built up slowly over time, over many years of heated, lively, and intense conversations. They had already navigated these choppy waters before and were simply inviting us to join them. The good news that we hear from Ephesians this morning is that we have been adopted into a family, God's family, that has seen all of this before. So despite living in an age where we are told every day that what we are facing is unprecedented, scripture tells us that there is truly nothing new under the sun. God has given us all of the spiritual resources that we need to navigate our lives. We just have to use them, all of them, even the ones that make us ask tough questions, even the ones that make us uncomfortable. And that is why I am so excited to be with you this morning on the day that you send off your group going to the National Youth Gathering. The gathering is truly an experience unlike anything that there is. I just, you, unless you've been, it's very difficult to describe how unique and amazing this experience is. Now, like all travel, things will go wrong, 
All of you who are going, know that now, be prepared. Things will go wrong, there will be hiccups, there will be bumps on the road, but God is with you. And in your interactions with 18,000 others, you are probably going to encounter some people and some stories that are pretty different from your own. Yet, what's going to be so magical and amazing and spiritual for you is that you are going to feel this immediate bond and this connection with all of these people that come from all over the world, because it's not just all over the country, there'll be people all over the world there. And you'll feel this immediate connection, aware that it is God's spirit that has brought you together to learn from one another as siblings in Christ. It is such an incredible opportunity, and I will be praying fervently for all of you that your hearts and your minds will be open for all that God has planned for you there. And for all the rest of you who are not going with the group, I hope you will join me in prayer. But not just prayer for the youth and the adults doing the traveling and what God will be up to in their lives next week. I hope you will also pray for yourselves, that you, that you will be open to the stories that the group will bring back here to you. That you will be open to receiving the spiritual gifts that will be revealed to these young people when they are away. That you will welcome their experiences and their questions, even if they make you nervous and uncomfortable and differ from your own thoughts. This is another aspect of what makes the gathering so special. That's how big and how powerful our God is. That the experience of the gathering isn't just for the people who will be physically there in that moment. God can and will transform all of us through this gathering. God can and will use it to teach all of us to call all of us, to touch all of us, to heal all of us. And certainly one way that you can be a part of that, if you want to, is to watch parts of it online, either live as it's happening or later. It'll be easy to find on the ELCA website. But the biggest and the most important thing is to be receptive dialogue partners when the group returns. Thanks be to God for the ways that we are called into relationship with our siblings in Christ, those near and far. I pray that all of us will continue to be open to the people that God places in our lives, especially when it makes us a little uncomfortable. Amen. <laughs>